Hello, I'm Chris Morosky. The title of this video is Cervical Insufficiency, and it is part of our Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Conference series. This conference is produced with and normally presented with Dr. Elizabeth Deckers from Harford Hospital. Let's first move on and review the goals and objectives of this video. Define cervical insufficiency. Discuss the risks and benefits of the treatment options for cervical insufficiency. Describe the various types of cervical cerclage procedures. Review the benefits of supplemental progesterone in pregnancy to prevent preterm birth. And solve an interprofessional education obstacle. We will begin this conference by meeting our patient, VH. VH is a 17-year-old G2P0010 who presents at 19 weeks to establish obstetric care. She states that her first pregnancy occurred at age 15 and was complicated by preterm premature rupture of membranes at 16 weeks, which resulted in delivery of a non-viable fetus within 24 hours of membrane rupture. She states that she was asymptomatic until her membranes ruptured, and then she began having regular uterine contractions. Six weeks later, she had an IUD placed at her parents' insistence that she not become pregnant again until she had completed high school. The patient and her 18-year-old boyfriend desired to become pregnant, and four months ago, she had her IUD removed without her parents' knowledge. She has no complaints today. She has no medical problems. She smokes five cigarettes daily and marijuana to help with her nausea and vomiting. What initial examinations and tests would you perform for her today? So our patient is a young, pregnant patient presenting at 19 weeks for prenatal care and she has a complicated prenatal history. And putting this all together, what would you think about doing in terms of her physical exam, ultrasound, and lab testing? Let's take a look. Here are the next steps in patient VH's care. In terms of physical exam, her vital signs. She is five feet, three inches tall, and weighs 148 pounds. Her blood pressure is 122 over 81, heart rate 86, respiratory rate 16, and her temperature is 98.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender, and she has a gravid uterus that is palpable at the umbilicus. On pelvic exam, she has normal female external genitalia, a normal vagina, normal antiverted uterus, and normal bilateral ovaries with no adnexal masses or tenderness. On digital exam, her cervix is noted to be two centimeters dilated, 50% effaced, and minus three station. On pelvic ultrasound, she is found to have a singleton intruding pregnancy with positive fetal movement and positive fetal cardiac activity at 162 beats per minute. There is a normal anatomic survey, and the adjusted ultrasound age is 18 weeks and 4 days. She has normal appearing amniotic fluid and anterior placenta with no previa. On transvaginal ultrasound, her cervix appears 2 centimeters dilated and the cervical length is 23 millimeters. Her lab work shows that she is A-positive with a negative antibody screen, her hemoglobin is 12.1, her hematocrit is 36.4, her hepatitis B, HIV, and RPR are all negative, she is rubella immune, her gonorrhea and chlamydia tests are negative, her urine culture is negative, and her urine toxicology is positive for marijuana. What is your treatment plan? Putting together this patient's obstetrical history, as well as exam findings of early dilation and effacement on digital cervical exam, also confirmed by a transvaginal ultrasound showing a cervical length of 23 millimeters, this patient has the diagnosis of cervical insufficiency. Let's first review what is cervical insufficiency. Cervical insufficiency is the not completely explained or understood inherent structural weakness of the uterine cervix. It results in recurrent second trimester or less than 24 week pregnancy loss in the absence of symptoms. So no pain, no contractions, no bleeding, no leakage of fluid from the vagina. There is just spontaneous dilation and effacement of the cervix and then pregnancy loss. This can be confirmed with a transvaginal ultrasound cervical length of less than 25 millimeters at less than 24 weeks and early effacement and dilation on digital exam. 
there are several general approaches to the treatment of cervical insufficiency. The treatment options are listed below. Expectant management, cervical cerclage, Hodge pessary, and progesterone. In the next few slides, we'll go over the risk and benefits of all of these options. It is important to note that for expectant management, there is a high risk of pregnancy loss for these patients. First, we will discuss cervical cerclages. In the picture on the left, you can see an open cervix consistent with cervical insufficiency or incompetent cervix, which is an old term for cervical insufficiency. On the picture on the right, there is a suture that is placed around the cervix to provide support. This is a cervical cerclage. When thinking about types of cervical cerclages, there are two types in terms of how the cerclage is indicated. An exam indicated cerclage is placed when the cervix is found to be short, such as in our patient now, VH. Unfortunately, the outcomes of an exam indicated cerclage are as good as expected management, so basically not very good. The second indication for a cervical cerclage is history indicated. A history indicated cerclage is placed earlier in pregnancy at 12 to 14 weeks in a patient with a history of cervical insufficiency. Had VH presented earlier in this pregnancy with her poor obstetrical history in her first pregnancy, she would have had the option to have a history indicated cerclage placed. History indicated cerclages significantly reduce the risk of loss and preterm birth. This is why it's important to take a detailed obstetrical history for patients, particularly those with second trimester losses. If a patient has risk factors for cervical insufficiency, she can be offered a history indicated cerclage, and this will make it much more likely that she is able to carry her pregnancy to term. In terms of the different types of procedures, there are various different ways to place cerclages in pregnancy, each with their own different risks and benefits. The most common cerclage procedure is called a McDonald's cerclage. This is shown in the picture to the right. The McDonald's cerclage is placed transvaginally, and it is basically a purse string suture that is placed around the cervix. After a patient is either provided a regional block, such as a spinal or epidural, or placed to sleep under general anesthesia, the stitch can be placed through the tissue of the cervix. It is placed in almost a clover fashion, as can be seen in the image to the right, and then the suture is tied down, thus providing more support to the cervix. The benefit of the McDonald's cerclage is that it is easily placed, has low risk for rupture of membranes, and can be easily removed at the end of pregnancy, either in the office or on a labor and delivery triage setting. The next type of cerclage procedure is a Schrodkar cerclage. Schrodkar cerclages are also placed transvaginally, but in this case, the vaginal epithelium under the bladder and over the rectum is dissected off surgically. The suture is then placed through the stroma of the cervix, and then the vaginal epithelium is sutured back over the cervix. The benefit of the Schrodkar cerclage is that it can be placed higher up on the cervix, and since the suture is covered back over with the vaginal epithelium, there is a theoretical decreased risk of infection. There is more surgical risk for a Schrodkar cerclage in that more surgery needs to be performed, so there's increased risk of bleeding and injury to the cervix or ruptured membranes at the time of the surgery. Also, in order to remove the Schrodkar cerclage, the patient has to return to the operating room to again dissect off the vaginal epithelium, or she has to keep the cerclage in place and have a cesarean delivery. A Schrodkar cerclage is usually placed after a previous McDonald's cerclage has failed. Finally, there is a procedure that is called an abdominal cerclage. However, this is now usually done laparoscopically or robotically, but can still be performed during open procedures. An abdominal cerclage, again, is usually performed after transvaginal cerclages have resulted in a subsequent pregnancy loss. These are much more risky because the stitch is placed up by the bladder and around the uterine vessels. However, the benefit of the abdominal cerclage is that it can be performed in between pregnancies and it has a high success rate. In these next few slides, I'll show you some brief video clips of these different types of ways to manage cervical insufficiency. The first two are going to be some of the cerclage procedures. In this first video clip, you will see a McDonald's cerclage placed on a simulation model.
Now in this video clip, you will see an edited version of a robotic abdominal cerclage placement. Finally, in this video, you will see a demonstration of a Hodge Pessary and Hodge Pessary placement. In America, Hodge pessaries are rarely used for the treatment of cervical insufficiency. This is a lot more common in Europe, and the research on this is conflicting, which is why you don't really see us using these very commonly here in America. All right, so now that we understand cervical insufficiency and its various treatment options, as well as VH's presentation, we have our first interprofessional education obstacle for our patient. Let's check it out. Your patient is recommended to have a cervical cerclage but she has no insurance and does not want her parents to know about her pregnancy. While in the state of Connecticut, adolescent patients are able to manage their pregnancy according to their own decision making, this patient requires a surgical procedure and she will require the consent of her parents. This is a complicated situation and you'll have to think about who can you use in the hospital environment to help you with this conversation to help your patient out. In this case, you will want to utilize your clinical social worker. With your clinical social worker's help, you obtain temporary state insurance because of her pregnancy status. With your patient's permission, you and the clinical social worker hold a family meeting to help your patient relay the diagnosis of her pregnancy to her parents. You discuss the need for cervical cerclage, and her parents provide consent for the procedure to be done. Following successful cerclage placement, your patient is still worried about her history of pregnancy loss and wonders if there is anything else that she can do in addition to the cerclage. What is your next step in her treatment? So the one treatment option that we haven't discussed with our patient BH yet is progesterone supplementation. Let's learn a little bit about that in the next slide. In this slide, you can see the various different ways that progesterone can be used to prevent preterm birth. There is a lot of controversy over the results of these studies, 
but for the most part, it does appear that progesterone has some effect to decrease the risk of preterm birth for American patients. The first type of progesterone to talk about is intramuscular 17-hydroxyprogesterone caprate. This is indicated for women with a history of spontaneous preterm birth less than 37 weeks. This can also be indicated for women who have spontaneous preterm premature rupture of membranes that results in spontaneous premature birth below 37 weeks. 17-hydroxyprogesterone caprate is given as 250 milligrams intramuscularly every week starting at 16 to 20 weeks gestational age until 36 weeks. Again, this is indicated for women with a history of spontaneous preterm birth, and not necessarily for women with a history of cervical insufficiency. However, due to the lack of research, for patients with a history of cervical insufficiency who have a cerclage placed, some providers will still give these patients intramuscular 17-hydroxyprogesterone to further decrease the risk of spontaneous preterm birth. The next progesterone to discuss is vaginal natural progesterone. This is indicated for women without a history of spontaneous preterm birth and who are found to have a short cervix at less than 24 weeks. This usually occurs in women who are presenting for an anatomy scan ultrasound and are found transabdominally to have a short cervix and have this then confirmed with a transvaginal ultrasound. This is actually a pretty rare finding. However, these patients are at increased risk for spontaneous preterm birth even though they don't have a history of preterm birth and therefore they have the option for vaginal progesterone to reduce the risk of preterm birth. Vaginal progesterone is usually given in the dose of 90 to 100 milligrams placed vaginally every day from the time that they are found to have a short cervix until 36 weeks gestational age. Again, there's more and more controversy around the use of progesterone to prevent preterm birth. However, there are enough studies that encourage us to use this tool to try to reduce the risk of preterm delivery for these patients. Okay, in this next slide, let's go on and see what happens to our patient BH. You prescribe her weekly 17-hydroxyprogesterone injections to prevent recurrence of her preterm birth. She quits smoking and her marijuana use. You and the patient discuss the need for urine toxicology screening each trimester. Her progesterone injections are covered by her insurance but she reports that she does not have reliable transportation to the clinic for weekly injections and does not feel that she can do these injections at home herself. So now what do you do? Turns out we have a bonus interprofessional education obstacle during this case. What are we going to do for our patient VH? This patient is at significant risk of pregnancy loss and preterm delivery, something that would be devastating for her and also very costly to the healthcare system. It is very important to put together all of the possible interprofessional resources to help this patient have a successful pregnancy. Let's see what we find out for her. Here is the final outcome for our patient, VH. After coordinating with her pharmacist, your social worker, her insurance provider, and the Visiting Nursing Association, she receives her cover medications at home. The patient does well with her weekly 17-hydroxyprogesterone injections. At 36 weeks, she breaks her water. She is evaluated in the hospital and her cerclage is removed and labor is induced. She delivers a healthy baby boy. She has negative urine toxicology screens for the rest of the pregnancy. DCF follows the baby out of discharge from the well baby nursery and through his first nine months of life. Eventually, the DCF case is closed. Total success. Great job taking care of your patient, VH. Well done, everybody. Let's check out our goals and objectives and see how we met them in this video. The goals and objectives of this video are as follows. Define cervical insufficiency. Discuss the risks and benefits of the treatment options for cervical insufficiency. Describe the various types of cervical cerclage procedures. Review the benefits of supplemental progesterone in pregnancy to prevent preterm birth, and solve not one but two interprofessional education obstacles. Again, great job. Thanks for watching this video. We hope you found it helpful. Good luck with all of your studies, and we'll see you around, everybody. Mm -hmm.